Hello, hello, and welcome to Hashtag Power Up, your weekly boost of virtual training sponsored by the International Sunday School Department of the Churches of God in Christ. And I'm your host today, Phil Representative Patty Johnson, and thank you so much for joining us. Listen, as you come in, please like, share, comment, and do something special for us today. Tag three people that you know that love Sunday school because we have an innovative and wonderful dynamic presentation on today that you don't want to miss. First, we want to give honor to our international presiding bishop, the Bishop J. Du Sheard, to our international supervisor, the Mother Barbara McCool Lewis, and to our international Sunday school department leadership, our superintendent, Dr. Mark Ellis, and our international field representative, uh, Mother Cleolia Penix. We are following us every week on Tuesday on YouTube and Facebook at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central, and 11 a.m. Pacific. And on today, we have a friend of Sunday School and Dr. Shoji Malone. Uh, let me do her intro. So Dr. Malone is an interdisciplinary humanities scholar, professor, mentor, speaker, world explorer, and fashionista. She earned a BA in public relations and marketing from Marquette University, a master's and a PhD in American studies from the University of Maryland College Park. Her research focuses on the roles of black church women and fashion in black culture and religion. Dr. Malone stands by her motto, research is also me-search, meaning that we can all learn more about ourselves by examining the past. This passionate professor is committed to helping mold the next generation of leaders through the study of history and culture. And in her teaching, she seeks to address structures of oppression through the discussion of material culture, policy, Black feminism, popular culture, and history. While she loves her work at universities, she does not believe that knowledge and information are reserved for the classrooms only, but should be available to the general public. With this in mind, Dr. Malone is also committed to public humanities through her work in museums, and her goal is to make history accessible to the masses. She attends Truth City, Church in Washington, D.C., under the leadership of Pastor Chris and Kalita Forbes, and they are an innovative and exciting ministry in this DMV area. So won't you help me welcome to Hashtag Power Up for the first time, but not the last time, Dr. Shoji Malone. Come on, let's give her a hand class. <laughs> Hello, hello, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. It's so good to be with you all. First, I want to thank the International Sunday School Department for creating an opportunity to share my research with you all and to the Power Up, Power Up leadership team. I thank you all as well. Um, we're family. I still believe that Sunday School is the best school. And so I'm a product of Sunday School. And so I love it here. And I'm so grateful to be able to share with you all this afternoon. And so if we can pull up the presentation. Okay, so today we are discussing rubies in their crowns, an examination of African-American church women and head adornment. And this is me. I am active on Instagram and Facebook. I'm a little bit more active on Instagram, but we can talk about that later. So next slide, please. All right, so here is an overview of what we'll discuss. We will start with an introduction to the research. We'll talk about the archive. We'll talk about Black women and head, of, head adornment in America from enslavement to the contemporary moment. And then we'll conclude. Next slide. All right, so as Pat, Evangelist Patty um, said, research is indeed me search. And so my research really started with my own experiences. These are pictures of me when I was smaller and my mother. And so she, as you can see, she is wearing a wide brimmed hat and a floral pattern dress. She is the inspiration 
for my research. And I really began to think about the ways in which she would adorn herself and how Saturday nights were reserved for getting ready for church on Sunday. I remember um, crying, getting my hair done, getting all of my dresses and bobby socks ready. She was very serious about it. She was um, pristine in her preparation for Sunday mornings. And so that led me to really think about how do we do and what do we do with the information and the things that are around us? What do we do with the patterns that we see around us? And so um, that is me in the middle. My mother is here, so she can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that that is my baptism. And then the photo on the far right is an Easter Sunday. I must have been five, maybe four or five at that time. And so my research really does start with my own life and experiences. And I'm sure many of you have these experiences as well. Next slide. And so by the time I got to grad school, I was looking through the archives because I had to do research projects. And since I was in the American Studies Department, um, much of my work was historical because you cannot learn about America without looking at its past. And so when I was in the archives, I noticed that Black women were adorning themselves in these elaborate ways. And um, I wanted to know why. And I wanted to know why Sunday mornings were so special to them and what that meant. Did, were they doing this for a special reason? Was there questions that they were asking? Were they pushing back? Were they being resistive? Were they just being church going women devoted to God? And so as a Christian woman myself, both practicing in practice and in a word, um, we have a particular ways of adorning ourselves and particular traditions that we hold, but I never saw anybody ask why we were doing these things, why we were dressing in this way, why we always went to Sunday school and children's church and why there were all of these traditions in place that women were the forefront of, but were not always represented in. And so in the archive, I just saw all of these pictures and I wondered what they meant and why they were there without context or without name or anything else. So I wanted to kind of put the story together um, in a way that was meaningful and that could help us really think through um, how Black women have contributed to the overall fabric of America and how they built communities in America. And so next slide, please. So I developed two research questions. The first is in what ways has head adorn have head adornments aided in revealing how Black women self-define, self-actualize, and perform self-awareness? And how do Black church women use and continue to use head adornment to express themselves socially, culturally, and politically? And so these questions were developed out of my studies in the archive. Next slide. Okay, so all of that to say, how do we get from the photo that is on your left to what we know now on our right, right? If you've ever been to a women's convention or a holy convocation, you've definitely seen something like what's on the right, but where does it start was my question. How do we get from these photos that are historical to what we see on the dais at women's conventions or at our jurisdictional convocations or workers meetings. How do we get from one place to the other was really my question. Next slide. Okay, so my study starts at enslavement. Although there are some remnants and some evidence that women have been obviously covering their heads since being on the continent of Africa, I have not yet found the thread through. And so my research really starts in enslavement. Now, at this point, I think it's important for us to really understand that enslavement is not what we think it was. Although we have movies like Roots and although we have 12 Years a Slave and there are various different popular culture pieces that try to get at what it may have been like to live under the horrors of enslavement. I don't think that we can ever truly know or experience the ways that these people live. It was true. 
slavery is an evil and it was a stain in our american history and so what people experience on a day-to-day -day basis we really couldn't imagine truly if we're being honest in the 21st century we live with phones and instagram and facebook and all sorts of technologies we could not really imagine what these people's lives were like but i really wanted to get as close as possible to understanding how their everyday lives function and then what did that have to do with their religious ex with their religious expression and their religious context and so although slavery is a, a long period uh scholars believe that slavery starts in the 1500s and goes until about 1867 my research specifically focuses on the 1800s because that's really when the photographic evidence starts to emerge just because of the technology of photography being developed during that time and so when i go into the archives and i see photographs most of them are from this time period for that reason and so that's why we start here and um in enslavement as many of you know the black identity was focused on work the reason that slavery existed was to oppress a people to build a nation and to gain financial and economic um advancement for particular groups of people, that being uh, those of European descent. So in this presentation, I will call them enslavers. They are not masters of people, right? We call them enslavers. And so much of the Black person's identity was wrapped up in what they did, how well they were able to perform tasks, violation, violence, and their submission here. And so, here on your left, you will see an uh, image of an enslaved person, although they're posed, that was likely at work. That is something she likely did for her job is to take care of someone else's child and rear and nurse someone else's child. And as you can see, she is wearing a head wrap. And so the head wrap becomes this symbol of servitude and bondage and dehumanization, whereas you know when we look at it we just think that that was the style of the day but in this instance she is wearing something that someone gave her likely because through our research we learn through things like manuals that were created that enslaved people were given allotments of clothing right and so in those allotments many times enslaved people were given hair wraps particularly women and they were forced to wear them um, and sometimes they wore them for functional reasons. So if you're working outside and you don't want the sweat to get in your eyes, you wear a head wrap to catch the sweat or so that bugs don't get in your hair. If you're working inside and you're cooking, you're, you cover your head just like many people do today to avoid hair from getting into food, right? And so there is a functional use for these hair wraps. However, um they also had a transformational um use as well so as enslaved women are almost being forced to wear these head wraps what they do is begin to create their own head wraps right they begin to be artisans of their own stuff and so they go in and use skills that they use and were taught on the continent of africa to benefit themselves here like dyeing fabrics dyeing fabrics is something that has existed on the continent of africa for centuries prior to enslavement right and these women become sewers and they begin to make their own fabrics they begin to make their own designs and patterns and so while they're being forced to wear these things they are also taking their liberties by styling them differently than would be normal right they begin to tuck and tie them in different ways they begin to pull this the side out they begin to put them over their head in specific ways um in addition to that hair wraps were used as a means of hiding shame because what is not often understood is that a punishment for black women at this time you know and in, in the movies they are always showing violent scenes of whipping and things like that but one other way that was used to punish people 
was more psychological. It was to shave the head and the hair off of a black woman if she did something that may have been subversive or what would have considered disobedient. And so in order to combat that, enslaved women are now began to covering cover their hair to hide that kind of shame and so they style it in a way that would suggest personhood and humanity outside of what was being done to them and so that is what they would do for their work day but oh when saturday would come saturday afternoon for many enslaved populations was just like it is for us. We're getting ready for the Sunday. We're getting ready for the big day, right? And for Black women, this is a humanizing experience, right? They begin to tuck and tie. They work, some of them work not only sun up to sun, sun down, but some people work from sun up to the next sun up, right? And so somehow they're finding time to create these things and to create these garments that will allow them to experience a level of humanity that was not often um, afforded to them in ways that would be um, keen to the eye. Right. And so in our image on the right side, this is a congregation of enslaved people. And as you can see in various different areas, you'll see some black women with the pink head scarf on, some black women with the blue head scarf on, some black women um, have the knot in the front, some have it in the back. Right. And so we when we look at travelers notes and things like this, this image is actually an illustration that was created by a European man who traveled and visited America and wanted to know what slavery was like. Right. And so this is from his perspective, what's going on and what he sees. Um, and so. From that, we can garner the ways in which Black women begin to use head garments as a transformational object, as opposed to something that would just suggest their status as enslaved women. Um, and so uh, you move from just a worker during the week to a Sunday where you then become a worshiper, which is altogether a transformational act and almost a subversive act. They become agents of themselves and they become humans again on Sunday, knowing that when Monday comes, people are then again going to refer them, refer to them as subhuman. Next slide. Okay, and so by the time we get to the turn of the century, slavery is not over. The Civil War has happened. And so many people are like, what is going on? What do we do next, right? Like, what is our next steps? And so for Black women, that comes in the form of trying to find employment and ways to support themselves and their families. So what many of them do is go to an option, the only option that was available for many of them, and that would be to do domestic work. To be a domestic would be almost like being someone's maid or being someone's maid. So you would take care of the children, you would cook, you would clean, you would walk dogs, you would host, be the servant for the party, you would be the person who did the gardening, right? And so they took on these roles, one, because they were familiar, two, because th these are the types of opportunities that were available for women post-Civil War. And so when we after enslavement ends, reconstruction happens, and then we get into Jim Crow, and we know that there were limited options for Black women in particular at that time. But what Black women are trying to do at this time is divorce themselves from the horrors and the violence of enslavement right? And so what does that mean? They try to adorn themselves in ways that would separate them from their work. And so um, in a book called Living In, Living Out, it's a study of domestic workers in Washington, D.C. Uh, she collects all of these oral histories of women who work 40 plus years in domestic service. And one of the um, quotes that is written there by Miss Josephine Moss. I believe she's 80 years old by the time she says this quote. She says, as long as you got that uniform on like she wants it, when somebody comes to the house and they're looking for Miss So-and-so, meaning whomever she may have worked for, but she was not there, 
her slave was there. That's the only thing they had it for. And so domestic white people are refusing <laughs> to separate black women from enslavement, right? What they're doing is trying to keep black women in that same space because we know that racial and uh, th that racial discrimination is happening real time at this point. Like racial discrimination is on high at this point. And so since since people know that one of the only means of employment that black women can gain is through domestic service, what they do is they give them uniforms that would suggest that they are the help, right? Everybody, hopefully everyone has seen that movie, The Help, right? They wear these particular uniforms that would communicate you work for said person, right? And it's an another attempt to take away the identity of these women and so the the um america is so tied to this narrative of black women being servants um and not in the way that we would have hoped that there is actually a bill that was signed and passed in the early 19th century um to erect a statue um, called the that was going to be called the faithful Mamie statue. Um, that is, you can see it here. Two pictures here of replicas of what this statue would have looked like. This was said to they were petitioning to get this statue erected where the Martin Luther King statue is currently. And what um, previously previous enslavers family wanted to do, they wanted to kind of acknowledge and memorialize their house servants by erecting this statue. And so no, what this shows is the dedication of the system of racism to preserving this particular look for Black women. And so as you can see in the pictures, the statue is wearing a head garment and holding a baby and an apron. Right. And so this where we see Martin Luther King, the Martin Luther King statue today is where this would have gone had it not been for other black women in Washington, D.C. petitioning to pull this bill down. And ultimately, uh, thanks be unto God, their work was not in vain and the bill never went through. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so in the middle image, what you will see is a, a collection from W.E.B. Du Bois. He collects all of this data about what do domestic people do that's not domestic? <laughs> what do they do when they are not at work, right? And um, as you can see in the first line, <laughs> church and church entertainment at home are what they're doing. So black women are going to work, going to church and going home at this particular time, according to the studies of W.E.B. Du Bois. And so when these women leave their jobs, right, they are working 12 hour days, often earning less than $10 a week. They are going into church as a liberatory act, right? They walk to church in these high garments. And so my question was, how do domestic workers go from having to wear head wraps to now wearing hats? And the answer is through millinery. Milliners are those who create hats and who transform hats and embellish hats, right? And so there's an emergence of black milliners that happens at the turn of the century. Millinery becomes an area of study at universities. Millinery becomes a way of entrepreneurship for many black women. And millinery is a way to beautify a community. And so millinery shops or hat shops become a site for church women to one gather and organize outside of the church. Um, in the photo on your left, you will see a group of people at May Reeves shop. May Reeves was a very popular milliner in Philadelphia. In fact, she used her millinery shop as a voter registration space and a shop um, during the 1950s and 60s. And she provided a space for women to come that wasn't a department store where they couldn't try on hats, they couldn't try on clothes, they would be being watched. It, it was almost like a freeing space. 
And so when a domestic woman worker comes into a millinery shop, it is indeed a place of freedom because you can try on what you want. You can do what you want. You can go where you want. You can talk to who you want. Right. It's a very different experience. And so what we see is the emergence of a entrepreneurial class as well that's happening and sometimes domestic workers work as domestics in the day and then they have side jobs as milliners at night so they are pulling together hats they are adding flowers to hats they are embellishing hats during this time as well and so I want to make sure that I pointed that out because entrepreneurship is such a huge thing now, but black women have always sought to be entrepreneurs in different spaces. So next slide. And I want to make sure that I'm watching my time. Are y'all all right? Okay. We have a little bit left. Okay. So that brings us to the contemporary moment, right? And so at this point, I want to talk to women and allow their words to speak for themselves. I can't speak to people who were alive um, and teenagers during the 1930s, but I can <laughs> talk to the people who are alive now. So I talk to church mothers. I talk to a host of evangelists, supervisors, first ladies. I talk to many women and they all said very similar things. I, when I asked them why they wore hats, they said most of them led with the fact that they believe that they were daughters of the king. If I am a daughter of God, then why would I look lowly? Why would I not present myself as, as the best as I possibly could? They reverence God. And so they want to make sure that they dress in a way that would communicate that to others. They want to make sure that as they're walking to church, that people know that they live these holy lives and they have the faith to back it up. Right. And so many of them talked about that. They also talked about the fact that they're preserving the legacy of their family members and their loved ones. This is something that their mothers did, their grandmothers did. And so they're just continuing that on, right? And they want to beautify themselves. Now, in addition, some of them talk to me about the fact that at this time, there were not a lot of spaces that women got to have a voice. Right. And even though they were building and institutionalizing and praying for and pulling up um, a lot of churches, many of them did, were not allowed to have speaking roles. Right. A lot of them were silenced and squelched. Right. Because sexism is also an institution that is um, prevalent during this time. And so instead of since they were not allowed to talk, they allowed their clothing to speak for them. And so when they would be dazzled, when they would wear bright colors, when they would adorn themselves in feathers and necklaces and brooches and St. John suits and sparkles and all of that, they were actually talking back. They were actually speaking without words being said. And so many of them um, took the opportunity to let their clothes be their voice. And so that was something that I really found to be paramount and very important. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the one where I always have to tell people that we just, we just need to breathe, right? And so um, there's this concept that I have developed that says hats cover a multitude of sins. And one thing that history does is it forces us to tell the truth, right? The historical record and the fact cannot be contended. And so um, when I was talking to a lot of these women, they talked about the fact that they were being abused, right? Many women talked about the emotional and the physical and the sexual and the um, psychological abuse that many of them faced, right? And sometimes the hats were not covering their own sin, but the sin of others. So if you have to pull it, they believe that if they could pull themselves together and not show what they were going through, they were actually covering for some some other people. And they were covering for some of our most beloved uh, spiritual leaders, in fact. And so I talked to a supervisor and she actually said to me that she counsels many first ladies and evangelists and elders' wives as they are being physically abused and they 
have to wear makeup to cover their eye bruises and large hats to cover um, the physical sign that there was something going on. And so what's going on in their house, what they want to make sure of is that what's going on in their house may not have been expressed when they went to church. They become a completely different person. And so um, another uh, woman that I interviewed, she talked about being sexually assaulted and how her mother, she was conceived out of a sexual assault. And she said that that put bad lights on her. So people began to look at her differently and treated her poorly because she is a child of a beloved um, spiritual leader, right? She was born out of an assault. So instead of blaming the, uh, the assailant, they would, they chose to take it out on the child. And then she ends up going, um, on and being assaulted herself. And so hats are a way for her to beautify and cover the fact that she has internal scars that no one is helping her get through right? No one is helping her to cope. No one is helping her to stride through. She says that everyone just told her to continue to show up and show up in her best, right? And so she goes on to become a youth leader and a choir director, but then those issues do not get addressed, right? Um, I, I've talked to first ladies and they've said similar things, how they were belittled by their husbands over the pulpit and so being told that they're not smart that they can't do something that they should just stay in their place over the mic and so these hats are able to cover all of that stuff not because these women have done something wrong they do admit that they are not perfect however they don't deserve what was done to them but the caveat here is that they said that they trusted god and that is what kept them going that is why they could show up in a hat with tears in their eyes and able to move on and so um hats in my opinion do cover a multitude of sins um next slide please and i think we're com we're just coming up on time Perfect. Okay. And so to conclude, when I was talking to the women, one of the most important things that all of these women were concerned with were the souls of those that they ministered to. And so one woman in particular, she believed that her hat was indeed a crown, but she said to me, um, it doesn't, if I, even if I have on the baddest St. John suit and the best hat, Helping a soul is another ruby in my crown. So I'll take off this hat to labor at the altar with someone. And so that just shows how invested they are into building um, their communities, into building people. And so um, I, that is what was the inspiration to my dissertation title and now my future works. Next slide. And I just wanted to say thank you to, to you all. Thank you for listening in. I see your comments. Thank you so much. Um, and it's such a privilege to be with you all. Oh, my goodness. I need you to, um, everybody, can you please, let's do these claps, these virtual claps, these virtual hands up. I mean, confetti, what, whatever you can you put in the comments. This, now, of course, I, I, I've already told you this, but this is groundbreaking, magnificent, pioneering research. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sister Mo. This is an amazing job. Oh, thank you. This is our international field, one of our international field reps, uh, Sister Waynell Henson, that Sunday school girl yes, herself. Yes. yes. This is Dr. Terrence Haynes. Yes, he's one of our frequent um, visitors here and presenters. I mean, up oh, there it is. There's Dr. Tony Terrain, Bishop Hello, Tony Dr. Terrain. Terrain. I mean, this research, young lady, I'm going to call you Dr. Malone, because let me tell you, you earned all of those letters, young lady. Oh, you earned you. all of those letters. Um, from working to worship, from head wraps to, to hats, I, you know, what popped in my mind while you were talking was this is a component of liberation theology. 
Absolutely. I don't think Dr. Cohn or or our, our the theologians have really explored. So can just 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 kind of tap into that a little bit yeah. more about how the hats and the head wraps and the you all of that was a little bit about liberation theology yes. for American women. Um, Absolutely. So I don't, I'm not a religious scholar. However, I do draw on the work of people like Kane Hope Felder, mm -hmm. um, who were content and who were dedicated to exploring the ways that Black people um, sought liberation and how God really wanted us to be liberated, right? Mm -hmm. Because again, enslavement is not of God. Like that is an evil of this nation. Racism yeah. is an evil of this nation. And so when we get, when we begin to think about the theological implications of, um, liberating women um i tell people this all the time the reason that many women were not emancipated before the civil war is because when you free a black woman you free a nation right wow. her children are then free wow. her family is now free her sisters are free her um cousins are free her neighbors are free right now she has the ability and the freedom to go and free others mm. and so when we begin to think about that not only in that context but from a spiritual lens when women get free Woo! right think about the implications of that now she can raise up children who will then go and get souls for christ right now when an when a liberated woman holds a mic it's a different level of weight and it's a different anointing that she can now speak from she's no mm. longer speaking from brokenness she's speaking with the power of the holy ghost and the host of heaven behind her and so when we begin to think about liberation theology in that way liberation didn't just happen in exodus liberation is the purpose of jesus christ yes and so when we when we talk about liberation and we talk about the liberation of a woman it's much bigger than a hat right and yes. i think and yes. that's my hope that everyone <laughs> was able to come out with that um as the focus that these narratives mm -hmm. just show up and these stories are so important because they speak of liberation amen girl i tell you i almost shouted hallelujah i think we <laughs> like we, we're, we're walking that line here today i one of the things you talked about i don't know if we have any more questions but um, I'm, I'm with you, Sister Adams. Cush, this girl is talking today, all right? This girl is talking today. She is definitely enlightening us. Um, and we all grew up in church. And I was telling my mom, I said, we, we look forward to Sundays and on the right side of the church in those first three rows yeah. where the mothers in all of their hats. And we were all, you know, you know, I mean, the hats that were adorned yeah. and we just thought about it as dressing. We thought about it as convention. But now when we look at the hats now, we're going to think about it in a whole new way, in a whole new light, because it means something for them to wear those hats. And why are they wearing those hats? And you really just gave us a little peek into African-American fashion women as well as our church women. One of the other things you really pointed out, which I didn't know or really think about, was the element of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. How hats allow women to express themselves. You made a quote like, um, uh, we, we always find a way to be creative in a different space than I guess what's normal as an mm -hmm. entrepreneur. So just talk a little bit more about how um, the millinery and, and that, that type, that era, uh, helped us as far as an entrepreneurship. Yes, it's really, millinery is really an understudied area, mm -hmm. which okay. is why I love it so much, right? And so um, Mary McLeod Bethune commissions there to be a fashion and design association in the late 50s, early 60s, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And in that way, what that organization does is it seeks to promote those who are interested in careers in fashion, right? So right. we have people like Zelda Valdez, who is most infamously known for creating ball gowns for Dorothy Dandridge and things like that. But mm -hmm. that organization also pushes 
women who are just like you and me who live in cities who work other jobs that's another thing i talked to a woman in dc she recently died at maybe like 103 years old she was the longest standing and oldest businesswoman wow. in dc wow was, uh, her name is uh miss vanilla bean and she was actually dorothy heights milliner and wow. so what she explained to me is that that organization gave them community and it gave them a space to kind of learn from one another. So mm -hmm. she also trained milliners in that organization. In addition, she told me that she came here from South Carolina to be a domestic and she hated it. So she went to work at a millinery uh -huh. factory, which she didn't know God was kind of like setting her up for her future. She didn't go on to work. She created hats in her house for almost 40 years while she was in her career at the post office. She didn't begin her business until she was around 60 years old. Okay. And so um, I think sometimes women kind of put their desires on hold because they have, you know, the husband and the kids and the church and the, all the things. Right. Mm -hmm. But what we see black women doing is forging a way right forging a way to find find some outlet to do something they love that also made them a little bit of money right and, yes. so, and so really i believe that the millinery develops out of a love for beautifying and helping others wonderful we have two more questions and i think we're going to wrap up dr hayes says how do you encourage women that wear the hat hiding physical abuse and i think he elaborated um you address can you hit the other one i think the other one he yes you address the shame with wearing the hat how can a woman hiding in shame find the strength to become the free woman you talked about uh jesus <laughs> um that okay. that is what they i mean i don't have another answer because that's what they told me um they literally say to me that their faith is what has now made them whole right yes so i'm talking to them as 70 year old women yes. right 70s 80s 60s right mm -hmm. and yes. so they believed that jesus was their answer now did they also tell me that they experienced depression yes did uh -huh. they tell me that they didn't always know what to do? Yes. Did they mm -hmm. tell me that they didn't have the answers? Absolutely. But all of them said that Jesus was what propelled them and what kept them in their, first of all, in their right mind. <laughs> and then second of all, it gave them ability to know and wisdom to know how to navigate in these mm -hmm. situations. And so that was... I couldn't encourage them because they were encouraging me. <laughs> they were legitimately saying that Jesus is it. Yes. That that was it for them. They didn't need anything else. They didn't need mm -hmm. any alcohol, drugs, or anything like that. They needed Jesus and they really depended upon him. And that's something that I wish all of us would do is mm -hmm. really depend on Jesus as the source and the answer for every question that we have. Yes. And I think Sister Adams kind of pointed out one of the things that you were saying is that um, the ruby in their crown mm -hmm. was recognizing their sister, um, tr um, talking to their sister, like she says, like knows like, helping them come through. And so, yeah, Jesus was the answer, but it was the answer that they shared with each other. Thank you so much, Sister Adams, for bringing that out. Dr. Terrain says, what does it mean that the contemporary church women are not wearing hats? Oh, that's a nice question. That is a very good question. I actually got pushed on that a lot in the interviews. Mm -hmm. um, mother, I won't say her name because I didn't tell her I was going to talk about her. But um, she said, to, I sat on her couch and she says, do you wear hats to church? I said, no, ma'am. She said, well, how do you consider yourself dressed? Right. And so she was shading me a little bit on that. Um, but what it exposed to me is that uh, she believed that it was a legacy that was attached to it that my generation maybe does not feel. And I don't want to speak for the whole generation because some yeah, of my yeah. peers do wear hats and some some of my peers do enjoy them. Mm -hmm. But when I went to the women's convention and tried those hats on, my God, I said, I don't know. <laughs> they are built differently because they're heavy, right? Yeah, they're yeah. not necessarily something 
that I would consider comfortable. But to them, it's like, why do you need what and why you need to be comfortable? You better lift your hands and keep your head straight to keep this hat on. Right. And so I think it's just a generational difference. I don't necessarily think that it there's any strife there or anything like that. I think it's just a progression of mm -hmm. a people and mm -hmm. every generation has something for them. It was hats. Now we have something else. Now it's really jeans and sneakers, to be honest, or mm -hmm. um, skirts and sneakers or kimonos, right? We just have other things that we look to, to kind of give us that same type of feel and reverence. Yeah. yeah. It, it's kind of interesting. That's, that's a real, uh, good question maybe for part two because i know like we don't really wear hats uh a lot either but i know whenever we really want to dress up we wear hats so the first time i took my girls to our national convention we were like we've got to have that hat for official day I, I, and i share that picture on my facebook page of all three of us dressed to the nines in our fantastic hats and guess what one of the mothers in the church gave us each one of those hats oh my because God. she said i wanted you to experience that and share that and i want to be a part of your convention experience and would you do that by let by wearing my hat and um so again there's a legacy there there's a tradition there and i i, th I think it's something that we, we shouldn't um get lost because your research for me has um enlightened me in a way about the wearing of hats different than just the it's so heavy and you know sometimes they've gotten a little expensive but the legacy of the hat and, and why it came about and what it represented for the african-american woman in church especially that comment you made about the hats lended their voice when mm -hmm. they when they couldn't speak that really, I thought that was something. So look, we're going to wrap up because, girl, we way over time. But what the hat bringing voice um, to address that sexism and that oppression that they even found in their religious circles. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, so I don't think that we like to address sexism in mm -hmm. the church. Just like um, Dr. Hayes is saying, you know, we also need to address abuse with counseling. Yes. Um which is a very valid point. We don't like to address sexism, mm -hmm. right? Because if we address sexism, then we have to address hierarchy and then mm -hmm. that becomes a little bit problematic, right? Then we have to restructure how we do everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so women find ways. That's another thing that I hope you all were able to yeah. take away from this presentation is that historically women find ways to do what needs to be done with yeah. very little, yeah. right? And so I think what's so paramount about clothing speaking for you is that you get to have personality in clothing. Mm -hmm. You get to you get to shade somebody in clothing. You get to style yourself and you can kind of be whoever you decide that you want to be mm. through an outfit, right? Yeah. And so I think that that is what they were doing. They mm. were able to navigate a really hard situation and kind of navigate around mm -hmm. an institutional issue with an object that is unsuspected. And so it goes to show the brilliance and the innovation of a woman, right? Mm -hmm. To be able to do something like that, that is almost like an activist work, right? It is an activist work. It is a transformational activity to be able to do something like that in a, in a space that is seemingly trying to squelch you, yeah. right? So I just thought that that was so beautiful when I um, came across, across that discovery. Yes. I'm telling you, um, Mother Worsham, Annie Worsham, my mom is on. Hi, Mother. <laughs> and my mother is a hat wearer now. She you will, is. And let me tell you, you will very see her, very rarely even see her in a casual outfit without a hat on. Um, so Mother dresses, and we love it. <laughs> Um, and I, as she says, we didn't really understand the legacy that has represented. And we got to have you back for um, part two. And we want you to check, give us your contact information because Dr. Haynes wants to invite you for a session with his women's ministry. So 
share with us how we can get in contact with you. Absolutely. So you can email me at info at shojivmalone.com or I'm on Facebook, Shoji Malone, Instagram, Shoji Malone. Um, those are all ways that you can contact me. Um, I'll share my presentation with you all so that sure. if you want to review it again, all of my contact information is on there as well. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. There it is. You can definitely get in contact with her on tonight. And this is the type of information that the International Sunday School Department is bringing to you. And on tonight, we want you to join us live tonight at 6.30 p.m. Central Time, 7.30 Eastern, as we join our president, uh, Pastor Mark Ellis, and the learning and development team as they talk about some of the innovative and new initiatives that the International Sunday School Department is going to do. Is that mom, Yvonne Noel? Oh, Whoa. hey, mom. Thank you so My much for joining here. us. Wonderful. Thank you. So that's that's such an honor uh, when you're in uh, Mr. Dominique Malone, who used to work with us here in the International Sunday School Department. And we still love the Malones here in Sunday school. Yes, David, <laughs> shout out to my husband, the doc, the, I was about to call him Dr. Maybe. Maybe. Um, Dominique Malone. Thank you. Yes. So uh, yes, our tech person, our tech guru. Um, guru. So listen, the, um, they will put that back up again. Those are our six um, lesson objectives. Yes. We're going to talk about those tonight. We're going to talk about our core values. We're going to talk about our new response of reading. Um, so you don't want to miss that tonight with Dr. Mark Ellis, our own uh, Elder Michael Payton, our VP of Learning and Development, and his team. And so, again, if you enjoyed this, please give us some hand claps. Make sure you share this presentation. And guess what? Everybody needs to invite Dr. Malone out to have this discussion with their churches. This is rich. This is groundbreaking. You're not going to find it anyplace else. I already told her, I can't wait to see her work in the museums. Um, it's going to be captured in the National African American Museum, the American History Museum. It's absolutely going to be there because she's capturing our history, not just for us, but for my grandchildren. Amen. Yeah. So they have something to look back on and understand why mommy and great grandma wore hats to church and what it really meant. Um, not only just liberation theology, but economic prosperity, creating our own identity, giving voice to issues in our community. It means so much. And when you free a woman, you free a nation. That was absolutely fantastic. I mean, thank you again for joining us here. And thank hashtag. you for having me. I will see you guys later. Thank you so much. Yep. Thanks for joining us at Hashtag Power Up. And as always, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hashtag Power Up is part of the learning and development arm of the International Sunday School Department of the Churches of God in Christ. We invite you to sow into this ministry. Your gift in any amount will help us continue to share leading edge biblical educational solutions, and leadership tools to churches, districts, missions, and jurisdictions of all sizes. Along with our president, Mark Ellis, we are aiming to continue to reach, teach, minister, assimilate, build, and involve people for the furthering of the kingdom of God. Furthermore, we want to eradicate biblical illiteracy. Your gift in any amount makes you part of this effort as well. God bless you in advance for your gift. We pray that the Lord richly blesses you.